This morning, uh, Brother Alex was preaching out of Philippians, and he was preaching about how we all need to be in one accord. Well, one church decided to take that a little too literally, and they had, uh, you know, the car, Honda Accord, so they all tried to fit in there and take a picture together all in one, all of one accord. Amen? So yeah, we know that that doesn't mean getting in a car together, but it does mean that we are to uh, look after one another. We're to to look after one another and we're to collectively serve Christ. Amen. So we we looked at in, we we read earlier, um, chapters 5 and chapter 6. Last week, we had talked about how the the new covenant... um, just like the old covenant, there is a place that we look forward to, to rest, to call home, that we are looking to enter into his rest. So the new covenant also has a promised place that we can enter into that, just like Canaan in the old covenant, for us, that new covenant, the place we're looking to enter into is the new Jerusalem, is the new city that he has gone to prepare for us. We also saw there were words of caution about falling short of the new covenant's promises. We also saw that we can stay on the right path by turning to our high priest. Our high priest is not the pastor. It's not the pope. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. He is the intercessor intercessor and the mediator of the new covenant. And we can find help when we need, and we saw that how Jesus Christ, is, he, he walked through the earth, and he's suffered all of the things that we have suffered. He has been tempted like we have been tempted. So he understands what we're going through, and we can go to him at any time. So that's what we, we talked about last time. Now, starting in verses 1 through 4, we get a little bit of background about just what is a high priest. What is a high priest? Well, the Hebrews knew what high priests were, but the author here decides to take a couple of verses and just talk about that. For every high priest is taken from among men, taken from among men, is ordained for men in all things pertaining to God. So the high priest is the one who, you want access to God, you go through the high priest, okay? that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So in the Old Testament, the high priest and the priests, the Levite priests, they were the ones who offered the sacrifices. Or if you wanted to offer a gift to God, you would bring it to them. So they were the intercessors who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. So there's two groups there. We have the ignorant. Those are those who are lacking understanding. Okay. Then we have those who are out of the way. means to like to roam, to deceive, to go astray. So there's sometimes we, we sin out of ignorance, out of just not knowing. Sometimes we sin out of malice. But the high priest at that time was there to intercede for those and to have compassion Not to be judgmental, but anyone who comes to the high priest, the high priest would have compassion on them, would help them to be able to reconcile with God, no matter the circumstances. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So one of the the features of the priests, of the, the Levite priests, was that they were all sinners, just the same as all of us. In fact, it says here in uh, in verse 3, and by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. So they were not just being a mediator on behalf of the people, but also on behalf of themselves because they were sinners. All right? And no man taketh Dishonor. So here's another attribute, is that no one 
uh, you know, the Levite priesthood, they, they weren't, they didn't just say, wake up one morning and say, oh, you know, someone in Israel woke up this morning and said, you know what, I'm going to be a priest. It didn't work like that. Okay, the, the uh, decision for who would be a priest, this was actually decided by God. So, for example, Aaron, okay, God said to Moses, he will be your voice. He will be the mediator between you, Moses, and the children of Israel, between you, Moses, and Pharaoh. He will be your voice, okay? And then later, you know, he, he appointed Aaron, the tribe of Levi, to be the, who the priests would come through, okay? It was not up to Aaron to decide that. And that's what it says here is in verse 4, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So we, we see four points there. We see, first, it was taken from men. The priest was taken from men and ordained to godly matters. To offer gifts. The second point is, is to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And to have compassion on the ignorant. Also, on the, those who are out of the way. Also, earthly high priests are sinners, and they need sacrifices too. And they cannot be self-appointed, okay? But they're called through the line of Aaron. So likewise, we see in verse 5, likewise that Jesus Christ, he did not just take it upon himself to become a high priest, Instead, it says, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And we saw before, when we were studying in chapter 1, 2, we saw how that took place at a very precise time. When God said that to Jesus, it took place at a very precise time took place after Christ already died on the cross and was presenting his sacrifice, the sacrifice for our sins to the Almighty Father. At that time is when God said this to Jesus. We saw that in Acts, that that, uh, that, that was made clear by the Apostle Paul. And so continuing on here, we see in verse 6, as he saith also in another place, this is another place in the book of Psalms, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days, uh, we'll, we'll move on to verse 7 in a moment. Let's go back. I want to take a look at who Melchizedek was. Let's go back into Genesis chapter 14. Verse 18. Actually, let's start in verse, verse 17. So if we go through and we read this chapter in Genesis, we see that the focus is on Abram. And uh, he wasn't called Abraham yet. He's still called Abram. Okay? The focus is on Abram and how he went to war with some kings how he was um, seeking to get back Lot and his possessions and, and his family, his brother Lot, and his goods and the women and also the people. And then in verse 17, so it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheder Lamer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava which is the king's dale. That word there, king's dale, it means like it's the king's valley. They called it the king's valley. Well, that's interesting. And then out of nowhere, we see this uh, verse 18. In verse 19, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him, he blessed Abram, and said, 
Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham, Abram gave uh, Melchizedek tithes of all of what he had just acquired in this battle. Okay, because because Abram prevailed in this battle. Well, let's go back and, and, and read this again, though. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, in the Hebrew, I want to read this for you in the Hebrew, how it actually reads, is Melchizedek, Melchizedek. The word Melchizedek means king. Zedek means righteousness. So when it says, in the Hebrew here, it says, Melchizedek is king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of peace. These were actually titles that were conferred to this particular man. Okay. And now, according to Hebrew scholars, it's unanimous that this man, Melchizedek, was Shem, the son of Noah, who had survived through the flood. If you go and read Hebrew scholars, they all agree, 100%, this was Shem. And uh, it, it must have been an interesting time. If you were alive at that time, after the flood, kind of a very odd time, because you had some people who lived a very long time, but you had a lot of people who, after the flood, lived you know, shorter lives like us. So what ended up happening was um, you had, uh, for example, Noah. Um, he lived for several hundred years after the flood. I think like 400 some odd years after the flood. And, and you also had a similar situation with, um, in fact, Noah. Um, according to the genealogy, Noah was still alive when Abraham was born. Okay, he lived a very long time. And uh, so Shem was still alive when Abraham was born. Shem would have been about uh, 465 at the time that these events occurred. Okay, Shem lived to be 600 years old. Okay. In fact, uh, well, could you just imagine that? Could you imagine being alive at that time and, and you have some people who survived through the flood Okay, what would people do about them? What, what, what would they, how would they treat those people that survived through the flood and have lived for hundreds of years? What they ended up doing was they, they actually sort of, re, they definitely revered them, okay? And some cultures, they treated them like, oh, you're now gods, you know, and they turned it into paganism, okay? In fact, if you go through and you read, um, there's, there's a writing, uh, not a non-biblical writing, but it's called the the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's an ancient, uh, one of the, the m most ancient writings that, that you can find uh, from that time. And uh, it was written by the Sumerians. Okay, it's written in a stone, so it's all carved into this stone, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in it, of course, there's a lot of paganism, but you have this point in the story where Gilgamesh, he's a king at the time of Su the Sumerian ancient uh, Sumerian tribe there, and he, uh, he wanted to learn about eternal life. He wanted to find out about how he could live for, he wanted to live forever. So he went to find someone who had survived the great flood. There was a, a man who it talks about that had a man and his wife who had survived the great flood, it says, okay? And that had lived, that according to the Sumerians, had been given immortality by the gods. Well, from their perspective, well, my parents died, my grand or my grandparents have died, my great grandparents have died, my great great grandparents have died. Yet this person is still alive. Okay, so they don't know if the person's going to die or not, right? So he went to go travel from Mesopotamia to go find this this man and to ask him, how did you get eternal life? Okay, and what he found, the answer he got, was quite interesting. The man said that the lot for mankind is death, that God withheld eternal life 
from man. Interesting, because well, he did. He withheld the, the tree of life from man in the garden. So I, I wouldn't take too much stock, though, in, in, uh, in extra biblical writings, but it's very interesting to see how much those writings agree with the biblical account. Okay, it's very interesting to see that. And so at that time, actually Shem, as I said, he lived to be 600 years old, and Abraham was about 75 years old. Abraham would live on for another 100 years. So Shem actually outlived Abraham. He lived another 35 years after Abraham. Okay, and that's kind of significant when we get into chapter 7, because in chapter 7 of Hebrews, it talks about how Melchizedek, Shem, or if this was Shem, I don't know, but Melchizedek being a picture and type of Jesus Christ, and how he is, had endless days. He, he lived on for effectively, well, that, that Jesus Christ has, it will live on forever, okay? So that, that's, uh, so the other thing about Melchizedek at that time is that he was the priest. He was the priest for the people in that region. If they wanted to access God, if they wanted to ask questions, if they wanted to know about truth, they would go and they would talk to Melchizedek. They would go to this place and learn about God. And, so, according to Jewish tradition, at this time when Melchizedek blesses Abram, this is effectively conferring to Abraham the priesthood. The priesthood. Now, by the way, Shem, he was actually alive before the flood, about, about close to 100 years, short, shy of 100 years. He was alive during Methuselah, during Lamech, okay? So he would have known them. Methuselah was the son of Enoch, right? And Enoch walked with God, and God took Enoch up. So we have a, a line here where, um, you know, these people all knew each other because they just lived such a long time. So they had a lot of the information about, uh, you know, Methuselah, he was alive during Adam. So there's not very, a lot of people between these, you know, between uh, Abraham and Adam, there's not a lot of people in between. The story, you know, would be passed down. And at this point, uh, the Melchizedek blesses Abraham. So going back to Hebrews here, so I'm not 100% I'm not sure that it is Shem, but it makes sense if it is. I'm sure we can ask Jesus when we get to heaven, and he, I'm sure a lot of the questions about what, you know, what happened at those, those times, we could certainly learn about from the Lord himself. But it says here that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, to be clear, Jesus Christ was not of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. As prophecy had said, he would not be of the tribe of Levi. So he was not of the Levitical priesthood. But what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that he was part of a greater order of priesthood after the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh, when he had, so this is talking about Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he was here with us, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, again, this word perfect is not in the sense that we often use it. This word perfect is teleos, it means, or tele, teleo, which means um, to be made complete, to, to be made finished, okay? So there were things Jesus needed to go through in order to 
be able to go to the cross and do the things that he did and also be a, a uh, high priest for us. He needed to go through this. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the, the word here in verse 8 where it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That The word obedience here is uh, hypoko... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not talking about verse 8. I should be talking about verse 9. So unto all them that obey him... Actually, it's the same word, so it doesn't make a difference because the, the word obedience there, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It's the same word that when it says them that obey. Um, so that word there is hypakaua, and it means to hear under, to listen to, or to conform. To conform. Okay, so... We see here, just a summary, we see here that Jesus Christ, he's after the order of Melchizedek. So he's, after, he's not after the Levite priesthood, but he's after the order of Melchizedek. And that he uh, became complete through obedience. The point here that, that he wants to say to the Hebrews is that Jesus became complete to be able to become the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him, he had to suffer. He had to die on the cross. And he had to be obedient. Moving on to verse 11. It says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So the word there, babe, means someone who's an infant that doesn't know how to speak, doesn't know how to talk yet. Okay. So like this one right here, Angela, she... Well, she's starting to learn how to talk. So, But when they don't know how to talk yet, Okay, it means, you know, when I read that, it means that, yes, they, you know, at one point in we're a walk, after we've gotten saved, we're a babe, we're a babe in Christ. We, we don't fully understand how to discern the scriptures, we don't fully understand uh, all of the things of God yet. We may have the, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we may have been baptized and been part of a church, but we still have a lot to learn. And so we've all been there. But he's saying to them, you should know these things. You should know about these things. And I want to teach you more about Jesus Christ, but I can't because you, you don't fully understand. You, you're not fully mature. You're not fully mature in his word. And the word, the word there for the first principles of the oracles of God, that word oracles there is logion, which means like an utterance, okay? It means like the, the truths about God. So we had these, these Hebrews who were immature. They were wanting to go back to the Old Covenant. They were wanting to go back to a place where, hey, you know, we don't want to have that direct line of communication with Jesus Christ. We want to, let's, let's put someone else, a, a priest, a different priest in there like we did, you know, before. Before we followed after Christ. 
let's just go to the temple and we you know, give our offerings and let someone else do it. Let someone else study the word. Let someone else tell us how we should live our life. You know, this is the sense that I get here is that they just, they didn't want to. It, it was too much work. It was too much for them. Uh, besides the persecution, they also just did not grow and learn about the things of Christ. They wanted to leave that to, just like they did in the Old Covenant, leave that to someone else to do for them. But, you know, we are all responsible to study the Word. We're all responsible to know the Word. We're all responsible to read God's Word and to discern. That's up to all of us. You know, when in Timothy, uh, Paul was talking to Timothy, in the book of Timothy, and he, he let's go ahead and go there. We'll, uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy 3.15. If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You see that he's talking to a pastor here. He's talking to Timothy, who is a pastor. And he says, you are not the pillar and ground of truth. No. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So, this is why he writes to Timothy how you ought to behave yourself as a pastor in the church. So, you know, we have a responsibility, each and every one of us, to study God's word, to understand God's word, to discuss God's word, to, to talk about it. We shouldn't just say, like, you know, the Catholics, they do is they say, okay, you, uh, you are a, a uh, priest. You tell us God's word. You discern God's word. And if we want to get to God, we'll, we'll come and talk to you. That's not the way Jesus set up his church. And so when we read through Hebrews here, it's, it's not like that. We, are, we have direct access to Jesus Christ, each and every one of us. And in humility... We need to read the word and understand it. We need to each be responsible to each other. Like he said in, in Philippians, we need to look out for one another. Going on to uh, chapter 6 now. Oh yeah, the, the other part here was their senses. Um, Hebrews, let's go back to Hebrews 5, verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. The word full age there, um, that again is that word teleos, which means to be complete, to be mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses, that is their perception, their ability to perceive, exercise to discern both good and evil. So now we go into chapter 6. Now, chapter 6 is often, uh, it's probably one of the more contentious chapters in the New Testament. You know, people often, they'll either avoid it completely, or they, you know, look at it, scratch their heads, and say, well, hmm, what's that mean? Okay. We're going to look at this, though, because when you look at it in the entire context of what we've learned so far about the church, and about the promises to the church, about the new covenant, when we look at it in the proper context, I believe it will make sense. It makes sense when you read it in the proper context. So going on to chapter 6, we have, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, I want to clarify just that, that little phrase there. You know, the, the translation here, sometimes the translation, there's just only so much you can fit into the translation in English. But there's certain words that I, I just want to kind of expound a little bit on the words that are used here in the Greek because it kind of helps to, 
the, the first word there, the principles of, is the word RK. And this is the word that means chief or corner, the magistrate, the power, the principality, the rule, okay? Authority. You get this idea of authority. So, RK of the doctrine, logos, Christos. Logos, meaning the word, Christos. So, I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. Like, what is saying here? Is he saying, like, all of the authority and power, leaving behind what we've talked about, that we just spent the last one, chapter one through five, talking about how much better Jesus Christ is than anything. So, leaving that behind, okay, leaving that behind, the, the authority and the, the power of the, the word, Christ, the word, okay? But that's, if, if reading through the Greek, that's exactly what it's saying there. Arche, arche uh, logos Christos. Let us go on unto perfection. Let us go on into com to be complete, to be mature. Let these truths about Jesus Christ develop in us to help guide us in the path that we are to follow, to help us understand how we are to walk, to grow, and to become mature adults in Christ. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So what, I want to ask you guys, what do you think the, the repentance from dead works? Can you think of some examples? So let's, let's try to think, slow this down a little bit here and think of some examples of dead works. Yeah. Um, well, I try to think of it in, uh, that could be or could not, I, I'm not sure exactly, but the, think of it in context of the Hebrews, uh, of the, the Jews here that he's speaking to. What would dead works have been to them? Okay, so give me an example. What's something that they might have done in the past that would be a dead work? The sacrifices. Yeah, the sacrifices, circumcision, keeping these holidays, uh, these uh, Sabbath days, all these different holidays for keeping all the feasts. The law is dead. And, and so these were dead works. Now the law is perfect, but the law had one purpose. It was to point out that we are dead. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and we can't keep the law. So them trying to keep the law, what they want to go back to is the law. Remember, you turn from that. You repented from those dead works, and you've followed after Christ. So not laying the foundation of repentance not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, you could also, and I want to say to Sam that, that I'm not saying that's not correct. I mean, if you're applying it to us as Gentiles, there are times we try to do things for our appearances. Yeah. So, we, or, you know, before in the world, we go and we try to do something to say, look at me, I am such a compassionate person. Look at me, I'm a wonderful person, or, you know, we've, um, if we've come out of other um, religions, you know, Catholicism, um, going and doing Hail Mary ten times, you know, they're doing these things to prove that I am something before God, that I, in your own righteousness. So, I mean, yeah, there is some application there to, you know, trying to, to do something within your own power to earn the approval of others. So, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So, when we got saved, we repented from our old life and we 
put our faith on Jesus Christ. Amen? Now you notice that it doesn't stop there. We don't have a period there, or we don't have it going on to say, um, and this we, we will, we don't go on to verse 3. There's a verse 2 there. You notice there's a verse 2 there. We don't skip on to verse 3 and verse 4 yet. Well, what does verse 2 cover? Well, it talks about of the doctrine of baptisms. It says, of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So, well, what's this doctrine of baptisms? Well, we know that baptism is not a part of salvation, of, of, of being um, saved from our dead works, of being saved from death. We know that baptism is not a part of that. So why is he bringing up baptism here? Right? I mean, the, the thief on the cross, Jesus said to him, Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. They all died that day. Right? How, when did he get baptized? We know baptism is not part of salvation. So why is he talking about baptism? And he didn't just say baptism. He said baptisms, plural. Okay? He's talking about doctrines that, you see, when we get baptized, this is the first step towards walking in the new covenant. This is the first step towards walking in the new covenant and then joining within a church. Okay? Baptisms, though, was talking about not just water baptism, but also when we talked before about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came down to the church, okay? Give us, to give us the um, abilities that we need, to give us the power that we need to accomplish his will in the world, right? And the Holy Spirit never went back up. So the, the Holy Spirit in, we see in the book of Acts, came down on those churches and we trace our line through those churches and so the Holy Spirit dwells among us. Amen? The Holy Spirit is among us. So baptisms, he uses the word plural there because he's talking plural both about water baptism and the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of understanding the truths about these baptisms, we're not, we're not going to lay that down again or laying on of hands. Well, that's something that belonged to the church. Laying on of hands. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4.14. We have uh, Paul saying to Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The presbytery being the elders within the church. So the church has the power, the ability to lay on hands and, and confer power to people within the church to do things with laying on of hands. Another example is Second Timothy Chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Okay, so the laying on of hands is, is something that um, is, it was given to the church. Okay, in order to authorize those to, you know, who, who go out in, to the villages to, to preach, to teach, and that they have the power of God with them, right? Of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, there were some at that time who, um, of the, because you had, you know, these people came out of Judaism. A lot of the Christians at that time came out of Judaism. And you had the Sadducees and you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. The Sadducees believe once you're dead, you're dead, you're gone. Okay? And then that's why maybe why they're called the Sad UC, right? 
So the Sadducees, um, they had, they were actually teaching, you know, still, still holding on to this doctrine of no resurrection. And in, in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 15, we actually see Paul addressing this matter. Um, let me find the verse. Okay, so verse, let's start at verse 12. Now if Christ, okay, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain, yea. And we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So in other words, if God rose Christ up, then he's also going to resurrect us too. Okay. Um, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is, in, is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And in if, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if we only have hope of Christ in this life and no life to come, we're pretty miserable. Because why are we going, uh, why are we living this particular lifestyle? Why not just eat, drink, marry, and be dead? Right? If, if there's no eternal, if there's no life after this life, what's the point of doing, you know, of suffering, of, of giving to God, of, of, of doing this for this life. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So, of the, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Okay? We don't need to talk, we don't need to lay these foundations again, not laying again the foundation of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now we could go on and talk about eternal judgment, but we'll be here all, all morning. I, I hope we don't have to go into that subject too, but we'll, we'll keep moving along. He says, and this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. That word enlightened there is fotizo. It means to shed rays or shine upon. Or, you know, to have light come out. Tasted of the heavenly gift. Um, this, this is the word dorea. Um, hold on, wait, let me find it. I'm sorry, made partakers, partakers of the, wait, sorry, tasted of the heavenly gift. Wait, where did, yeah, that word gift is dorea, which means like a grat gratuity or gift. Um, so he, you know, when we have Peter talking to the, the men in Jerusalem in chapter 2 of Acts, he says, be 
uh, believe and be baptized, every one of you. Repent, believe and be baptized, every one of you. And you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So that same word, gifts, these were given, these gifts were given to the church. Sorry, I'm getting lost here on, on reading, so let's go back. And having tasted the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And what happened? The Holy Ghost came down on all of them, okay? The Holy Ghost never went back up. And have tasted the word of God. That, that word of God there is actually not, the, the word for word there is not the word logos. Uh, it's a different word. It's the word chrema. It means an utterance. It means a speaking of God. Okay. And the powers of the world to come. You know, they, were, they had miracles that were happening. They got to see God's power. If they shall fall away. Now notice the pronoun there. It's plural. Remember the Hebrews were thinking about going back to Judaism. They were thinking about going out of the new covenant. If they shall fall away. To renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And you know, before we talked about the, the parallel between Moses when he struck the rock twice and the promise of him going into the, of into him going into the promised land of Canaan, God said no. Effectively, he but the, the rock representing Jesus Christ, by hitting that, by being disobedient and hitting that rock a second time when God said, just speak to the rock. He disobeyed God. And he was putting, effectively taking that picture and crucifying Christ again before Israel. And so we see here, if they were to go back if they were to leave out from the new covenant and go back into Judaism collectively as a whole, leaving out, what would happen? How would they be able to then go and come back and be a church? Okay, this isn't talking about their eternal life. This isn't talking about them losing their eternal life. It hasn't been talking about that up to this point. It's been talking about the promises, the promises that are made to the second covenant, the new covenant, okay, for them to come back. Now, let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's take a look at, well, first off, uh, the, the word there, fall away, is parapipto, means to fall aside, to go out of the way. And then the word renew them again, it's only found here, this is only found one place, this is um, anakinizo, which means to, to make fresh again, okay? It's kind of like when you have, uh, well, when you, uh, have you ever made bread before? Okay, and it only stays fresh once, right? Now, we use leaven in bread, but if you, at that time, you know, if you took bread and um, if you, they, they didn't add leaven to it, okay? If a little bit of yeast got in there, if mold got in there, it made the whole batch bad, okay? And we see in 1 Corinthians where they're saying, where Paul is saying to them, get that one from out from among you. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay? But effectively, what we have here is if they all left out of the new covenant, how would they come back? And the Holy Spirit is no longer. They would just be a club at that point. They would no longer be Christ's church at that point, if they all left out, is what it seems to me that he's saying here. How are they going to be able to come back and be Christ's church after that? And if we go to Revelations chapter 2, we see in verse 4 through 6, he's talking to um, the church at Ephesus here. He says, Nevertheless, 
I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come quick. I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Okay, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the, the word there, Nicolaitans, is the word, it's the, the Greek word is Nico, is two words actually, Nico and Laetans. Nico means to rule over, a victor. To, to conquer. Laetans means the laity, the people. Okay? There was a doctrine that was creeping up at that time. We also saw, uh, well, they, they were wanting to go back to the time where, okay, we leave, let, let's just let the pastor be in charge. And let the pastor tell us the, God's will for our life. Let the pastor be the one who studied the scriptures and tell us what to believe. Okay? Let the pastor be the one who uh, basically will just go to the pastor when we need anything from God, just like in the Old Covenant, okay? And in Rome, in Rome, actually, during the time that Revelations was written, um, Paul had passed away about 10 to 20 years before that time. And in Rome, there was this issue starting to develop, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, where they were starting to set up these hierarchies. Because, you know, they saw the Roman government. The Roman government has conquered much of the earth. And if we want to, you know, to accelerate the spreading of the gospel, let's do the same like what they're doing. We're going to set up a hierarchy. We're going to set up people who are in charge. But, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, among the Gentiles, you have the lesser serving the greater, but among you, it will not be so. The greatest among you will serve the lesser. Greatest among you will serve the lesser. So the pastor is in the role as a servant to, to bring the, the word of God before the people. And that's the proper role of the pastor. Um, but what they were wanting to the, the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the church at Ephesus, had resisted that doctrine. They were not taking part in that doctrine. And that was what Jesus said, you've got this one thing going for you. I've not left your midst because this one thing, but I want you guys to repent of these other issues so that, you know, I don't have to pull my candlestick from among you. Okay? Well, what happens if God pulls his candlestick? Well, let's look at the Catholic Church. You know, the church at Rome, what did they do? They followed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They ended up getting real close to the, the um, Roman government because, because the, the truth, as we saw in Timothy, is kept, it resides within the church, not within a man, not within the pastor, but within the church. They had given that up when they said, you know, we're going to set up these hierarchies over us. And so when they started to do that, they began to turn to baptismal regeneration. They lost truth. Doctrine went out the window. They no longer followed proper doctrine. And those doctrines went out the window. And then they would eventually become, they took on the name, Catholicos, Ecclesia. Do you know what the word Catholicos means in Greek? Anyone? Huh? Universal. universal. The word Catholicos, it means universal. It means that, that all of these churches are all just one church, okay, under one umbrella, okay? So they believed in a visible, universal church. Again, they walked away from the truths of God. They walked away from doctrine. You know, and, and we here, we, we're a local independent Baptist church. We believe that only Jesus Christ 
is the head of his church. The pastor is not the head of his church. The deacons are not the head of his church. Only Jesus Christ is the high priest. Only Jesus Christ is the mediator. And ultimately, when you, you lose that, if you lose that, if we lose Jesus Christ as the head of the church, if we replace him as the head of the church, are we really his church anymore? Now, ultimately, it's not up to me, it's not up to you to decide what is his church and what isn't. He is the decider. He is the mediator. He is the one who says, this is my church or this is not my church. Okay? But we want to strive to be his church. We want to keep him as the head of the church. Let's look at one other passage in Matthew 25. This uh, is a parable that Jesus gave, and we need to get the context here. The disciples came to Jesus privately up in the Mount of Olives, and they asked him a question. They said, how do we know these things are going to come to pass, when these things will come to pass? Okay, and, and this was one of the parables, without going through all of chapter 24, this is one of the parables that Jesus gave them. He says, then... He's talking to believers here. He's talking to his disciples here. He says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. And I believe this to be, the, these virgins uh, represent churches, okay? And that the, the, the oil and the lamp represents the Holy Spirit, okay? And if they, there's going to be a lot of churches, though we know there's a lot of churches out there that they believe they're following after the will of God, but they've gotten so doctrinally off from God's will. They call themselves a church, but they're no different than a club. And, you know, there's, I, I know people in the, who are Catholics, who, who are believers, who are saved. I mean, it's, they've given me their testimony of salvation, how they got saved. And, you know, I believe that they're truly saved, but they're not serving in the new covenant. And so we want to be sure that we're serving in the new covenant. We want to be sure we're serving in a doctrinally correct church where the Holy Spirit resides, where his power resides. And that's, that's what I see when I read this parable in the context is that it's saying, you know, we need to watch, therefore, for you know neither, neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So going back to Hebrews chapter 6, again, you know, these things that were brought up in the earlier verses were things that were given to the church. So I believe fully that, and that the pronoun is also they shall fall away. So I believe fully that this is speaking about as a church falling away from the um, principles of God, falling away from being, having Christ as their head. Okay. Now, fortunately, we know that Jesus is long-suffering. Fortunately, we know that Jesus is long-suffering in that, you know, he said to one of the churches in Revelations, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. You see, Jesus Christ will even, if, if let's say just five of us are still willing to follow the truth, let's say the majority of us go off into heresy, 
if five of us are willing to follow the truth and separate ourselves out to be with Christ, he will still go with that group. So he will always have his churches here. He says that, that the gates of hell shall not prevail, but that doesn't mean that we ourselves cannot, like these Hebrews, walk out of the path that he has for us in the new covenant. And it says here in, uh, in verse 7 and 8, Okay, we get to verse 7 and 8, for the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So you see, when we're serving in the new covenant, we can produce fruit for God. We can produce fruit uh, of, the, of the fruits of the Spirit. We can walk by faith. This is the proper place is within the new covenant. But outside of that, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. That word there, nigh, means close. It doesn't mean quite the cursing yet, but it means oh, you're close. You know, there's times when I was a kid that my mom said, I was this close to taking your head off. And as you can see today, that wasn't what she did. She never took my head off. So, but I get that sense here that, you know, they're close to cursing. But, you know, if, if you're a believer, um, there is no condemnation come to you. But you can miss out on a lot of these promises in the new covenant. You can miss out if you're not taking part in the new covenant. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. What happens when you have, let's say we've got a field and it's in the dry season here and we, um, we start it on fire, okay? Does the, the, the dirt burn? Does the earth itself burn? No. So the example given here is, you know, that, that you, you light the, the thorns and the briars, they burn, burn away, okay? The earth itself doesn't burn, though, okay? Even, you know, that's, this is the example he gave, okay? The earth itself doesn't burn, okay? But the thorns and the briars that grew out of it will, will burn away, okay? And I get the same sense that, you know, we saw in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15 here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the believer, you know, we, we do a lot of things in our life. The only way we can, in this dispensation, the only way we can serve God and serve Christ is within the New Covenant, within the New Testament church. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we can produce fruit that is, that is pleasing to the Lord. And that fruit will survive, that, that God will reward us for. Or we can produce thorns and briars. There's lots of things I know I've done that, that are just thorns and briars, and it's going to be burned away. There are things that are wood, hay, and stubble. We've all done things that aren't always pleasing to the Lord. You know, things that maybe don't even, just don't even matter. Something we buy for ourselves, and, ah, oh, you know, that was nice, but is it really going to have any effect on eternity? Probably no. So there's a lot of those things that are going to be burned away. Okay? But the earth will not it doesn't get burned, okay? I see this two ways. I see this as one that, you know, when, when uh, someone is put out of the church, like in 1 Corinthians, God pursues after them, okay? There's, a, there's consequences, you know, for, for themselves that, that uh, their, their own life will not be fruitful or productive to God, 
okay? And that, in a sense, they will be burned even while they're here, in a sense, as God chastises them, chases after them. But, you know, when you burn those thorns and those briars, it actually fertilizes the ground. So if, if that, we saw in 2 Corinthians, if you go to 2 Corinthians, the man who was, who, um, was kicked out of the church in 1 Corinthians, they, uh, Paul says, okay, he's repented. Bring him back in. Let him come back in. And so then there's opportunity for there to be growth and for there to be uh, fruit to be produced by this man, for him to live a life under the Lord. Okay, so I see that there's possibly talking about here and now that, you know, we could, we could uh, it's preparing the ground to grow more. Or, you know, if, if we do not repent and join a New Testament church, then all of those things that we've, we've built for ourselves is just a waste. It's going to be gone. In eternity, those things will not be brought with us. They will not have any effect on eternity. But you, if you're a believer, you're in God's hands. Your salvation is, is assured. If he has saved you from the consequence of death, that is sure. Whether it was in the, the Old Testament, whether you, you had gotten saved before Jesus Christ came to the scene or after, is the same. But again, what we're talking about in Hebrews here is the second covenant. So, covering through verse 7 and verse 8, um, we see it just says nigh to cursing. It doesn't say cursing. So that's why I don't believe it's saying that um, these people are lost. But it says nigh to cursing, close to cursing, but not quite cursing. Verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is, so he's saying, you know, we, we believe you are still one of Christ's churches. We believe he is still your head and that you have fruits that you have worked to Christ. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And that, that word there, serve, uh, minister to the saints means to serve to the saints and do serve. And we desire that every one of you do, do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we see here that um, this is talking about that, that one, the first point I get is he's, the, the writer of Hebrews is persuaded, he believes that there are better things about these, these Hebrews than what he's just got done saying. He doesn't believe that they've fallen away. He doesn't believe that, he believes that their church is still, has potential for Christ and that Christ is still the head of this, their church. And he, he says that he believes, you know, that they're not going to fall away. They're not going to go back to the Old Covenant, go back to, to the Old Testament worship. He believes, so that tells me something. When he we puts it in that kind of phrasing, he's saying that it's not up to me to say, to judge whether or not you guys are a church for Christ. That's ultimately Christ's, decision, Christ's call. But I see fruits. I see the fruits of the Spirit in you. Okay, so I'm persuaded. I believe that yes, you are one of his churches. I'm persuaded of better things, things that accompany salvation. Th those are works of faith in the new covenant. You see, before we're saved, we cannot produce any fruit for God. Outside of the church, we cannot produce any fruit for God. But after we're saved and after we become part of his new covenant, we can produce fruit for God. We can produce things that accompany salvation, that are past salvation, okay? Works of faith that are in the new co covenant. And we'll talk more about the 
faith about, uh, when we get into later chapters, about the hall of faith also, um, in some, of, some other covenants in the past. God knows their works and labor of love. So God is the one who sees and knows what everyone, what, what they're doing before him. But he says, do not be slothful, but he says be, um, where am I at here? Oh, followers. So that word followers there is an interesting word. It is the word mimetes. It means to imitate, to do like the same, to be imitators of those who by faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay, that's, that's what it means of followers is the way it's translated there, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. But again, we're still talking about inheritance, We're still talking about promises that are made to the New Covenant, to the New Testament church. It's not talking about eternal life. It's talking about things that accompany salvation. Okay? So when people go through chapter 6 and they say, well, this is talking about salvation, and then you can possibly lose salvation, and then you can't can't be saved again or something like that, it's not talking about that. So far, he's not been talking about salvation. And he's still not talking about salvation. He's talking about the new covenant. Okay. Verses 13 through 15. Finally wrapping up here. For when God made promise to Abraham. Now keep in mind, Abraham, when God makes promises to someone, he only makes promises to believers. He's only going to make covenants to believers. So when he made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he, that is after Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. And so the encouragement to us is to patiently endure till either Christ returns or till our own death that we patiently endure within his new covenant the word that he's giving to these Hebrews is that they patiently endure in this new covenant and follow after Christ keep him as their head okay well that's that's all I have for you do you have any any questions or comments So far, okay, thank you.